here, I've been to marriage conferences and I love them. And when they they renew the vows at the end, that just wrecks me. I love it. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. And so um, I realized um, I, I just would like to share like how this all started, this conversation about marriage preparation. I'm going to take this you know, little statement from um, a podcast I, I listened to from Messenger International and this uh, young woman was actually speaking about being single and she was speaking on the topic of marriage and um, like her, I am what you know you would call very, very single. I'm very single. <laughs> I I'm, I'm, don't have a boyfriend. We don't, we, I've, I, 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 I can't remember the last time I've been on a date. Um, so like I just, I'm very, very single. Like I said, I'm re reviewing applications now, but after an eight-year man fast, some of you know my testimony, after an eight-year man fast, I was like, yeah, somebody get married now. That didn't happen. So, <laughs> you know, but you know what? I love it. He's not late, right? Can you get an email somebody? All right, okay, he's not late. He can take his time because this is what I realized, and, you know, maybe some of you need to realize this too. I'm just going to talk straight. Is that all right with everyone if I just talk straight? Okay, cool. Okay, because I realized that when I get married, I've never been married before. I don't have any baby daddies. I, I just, but I messed up a lot. Oh, BC, I messed up a lot. And so it's a miracle that I didn't come out with some baby daddies and some like ex marriages and some, some really, you know, would have been some hard stuff to go through in life. Um, but, but, um, but I realized after accepting the Lord and after walking with Him for some time, I realized um, I, when I get married, um, I don't want this season back. And this season, you might think, is not important, but it is. Uh, it's important because this is the season that Paul talks about that you are undivided in your devotion. You have no distractions. You don't have anybody saying, you know, oh, I need to be here, or in my clothes, you know, whatever it is that, what, you know, what do spouses do? <laughs> you know, like we need to go do this, and you can just have, you have total control over your calendar and who your friends are and where you want to go for how long, how late you want to be. You don't have to answer to anyone. You know, you kind of practice doing that in your boyfriend-girlfriend relationships and your courtships, you know. But, you know, really, in this season, you have absolute freedom. You can serve, you can volunteer, you can go on vacation, go on retreat, you can take your time, you know, sit at a coffee, do whatever you want. And, and okay, okay, maybe just not, maybe just me, not you. But we, like, want to hurry it up and, like, want to get, some, get somewhere because we think that marriage is, like, a destination that we, we absolutely need to get to. And it's true, I want to get there, but I do not, I don't need to, like, like exceed the speed limit. <laughs> right? I don't need to gun it, and I don't, you know, because you will get a ticket. <laughs> That's not good, okay? And so, so you just want to make sure that you are really mindful of this season, you know. Um, I'm loving this season because if I didn't have this season, I would not be standing here and the Ministry of Purity with Plain Jane and Plain Jane Intro Project would not exist. I would have said, oh, well, I'm married now. I don't need to have a purpose because my purpose is to serve you. Oh, got quiet. <laughs> you know? And because that's what happens for women. I'm just going to speak for us if that's okay. Y'all, this is class participation. Y'all can shout out, throw an amen, do a, uh-uh, no girl. You know, you can do whatever you want. Okay? So, the way I see it is when anytime I was in a relationship, and I've really only been in like relationships BC, you know, so all of those relationships, the moment the guy showed up, I just like had no, I, all of a sudden I didn't have a hobby, I didn't have anything to do, I was always available, what, what are you doing, Nancy? <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden there's like, you know, I'm just absolutely available, but you know what, because I have this season in the Lord, um, I sought him on what the season is for. He led me into the ministry of purity, which is hilarious. But he led me into it, and and I love that uh, it's led us here. There's a lot of information I want to share with you all um, uh, that I've been gleaning. I have been reading a bunch of marriage preparation books, you know, <laughs> CDs, DVDs, all those things. How many of you have read one or two marriage books? Okay, all right. How many of you have read like one or two singles books? 
okay, okay. It's like all the same people. <laughs> the other people are like, you don't read, girl. <laughs> You know, but um, all right. Well, I've been reading a lot, and so, and I've been just sitting, and you know, um, wow, it's serious, you guys. Marriage preparation is no joke. Oh my gosh, why people wait to do that is I can't, I don't understand. How do they do it? How do they do it? There's just no time for that, because I, I'm, I don't mind even in a relationship, and I'm like, oh my gosh. These questions are really, really intense, you know? A lot of people are like, okay, well, you know, I really want to kind of hurry up this season. Don't you want to be married, Rowena? Don't people that don't, don't, look, do you have a desire for marriage? Yes. Uh, do you want to have children? Uh, yes. You know, because they, they think because I'm single and I'm in the ministry, oh, I must not have desire, have that desire. I'm like, I'm, hello, I am a woman, I'm like, I'm just like you, I'm not superhuman, you know, um, I do desire those things, but they think, oh gosh, and you're still alive? How is that possible? <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm not like, you know, desperate anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> God, God had a way that Pastor Jensen at, at Free Chapel, he preached a sermon called The Power of Now. And, um, you know, I Instagrammed this because I was, like, had this revelation in the car on the way home. I, I bought the CD and was listening to it. And he was talking about the power of now. And that just, you know what sealed it for me, the power of now? I, in that moment, I was just thinking about, oh, marriage and what it would look like and if it was going to happen and is, am I okay if it doesn't? You know, all of those questions that were coming up right there in my heart, just between me and the Lord in the car. And, um, and what I realized was, oh, my goodness. What I'm doing right now honors my husband. It honors Christ, so it honors my husband, right? Proverbs 31, 11 says, the heart of her husband safely trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. And 12 says, she does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. I am not even dating him yet, and I, do, I can do him good right now, all the days of my life. This honors him, the friends that I have, the clothes that I wear, the hobbies that I take up, the cooking that I do. It blesses him. It does him good and not evil all the days of my life. Because I'll be honest, the first half of my life, ooh, kind of sketchy. <laughs> there was no good happening over there. You know, thank God he, like, blots it out. You know, where's that scripture where he blots it out? Ooh, thank God. I don't have to explain that to him, you know? And so, so praise the Lord for that. So that is the power of now. You can take your, your unmarried season and honor your spouse all the days of your life. Okay? And so some of you have, have, are awesome. You know, some of you, um, I know you've been married before. And you're walking with the Lord, and this might be the first time you're, like, seeking God's design for marriage, you know? You, you did it in your, your, the, your, old, your the old design, and now you're seeking that in, in God's design. And it's, he gave you a, a, a brand new slate. He did. His grace did that for you. Okay? I've been researching, and this book, one of my favorites, okay, this is the one that I'm going to really plug because this is by far. Um, John and Lisa Bevere's The Story of Marriage. It's an incredible book. I'm going through it. I mean, you might see some of the. I mean, there's there's like there's a devotional. There's like there's a lot of questions to to answer. But it's important for us to start preparation now for the vision that you have in the future. So because when you start the race, you have an end. So you want to make sure, I love how John and Lisa Bevere says this, they said, begin with the end in mind. If you have the vision in mind, you will start and make sure when you, when you have your eye on it, you'll have, you'll have the trajectory, the direction in which to go. If you don't have an end, you are going to flail around and do all the kinds of things that you used to do in Jesus' name. You used to do that. Okay, and so when you have that vision, I love that you will honor not just your first love, because who is our first love? Christ. He is our first love. So I thought about this, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, everyone's hashtagging happy anniversary, hashtag my first love. I'm like, this is not your first love. <laughs> you know, I'm like, 
I'm like, I'm always talking about my first love. Who doesn't want to talk about their first love? I love the Lord. He's my first love. I, you know, I messed up. We broke up a lot of times, and then we got back together forever, you know? So, you know, so thank God, right? And so, he was gracious. He was gracious. So, we're for keeps now. He's got me for keeps. But you know what I realized? Like, in the design of marriage, my husband is my second love. That's right. Forever. He's my second love. You know, until death do his part. You know, and so I'm not rushing to get to that part. However, I want to make sure that we get there successfully. Amen. Right. All right. So I'll share this part. Okay. So what? Here's here's my my conversation with the Lord. Um, premarital counseling at the point of engagement is usually when when everybody does it. Right. Okay. You get you get engaged. The majority. Right. We'll do it at the point of engagement. I had an aha moment. I was like, that is too late. When you get engaged, what is a couple doing within three to four months of the engagement? Planning a wedding. Right. Um, the premarital counseling process, according to Pastor Charles, because I've been learning, is about a three to four month process. I don't know about you guys, but it, I've, he's, Pastor's given me some homework. And, and, you know, it's, it, in the book it says, oh, two hours of homework. It took me six hours. I don't know how you have time to fight the temptation to have sex and, you know, before marriage, how, how to meet all the in-laws, plan for the wedding, do the cake tasting, do the flower arrangements, all of those things, and go to premarital counseling, and do your job, and do six-plus hours of counseling. What about the dress? What about the dress? That's right. And everyone's on a diet. They're eating leaves and like a little piece of a cookie because they're trying to they're trying to be like the better like version of themselves. You know, it's like a real. It's like it just goes in a, in you know in, in in just a cloud. You know, and so and this is what I you know I, I realized I was like oh my gosh okay most mo how, how most marriages Christian marriages like. What's the time frame that they usually, like from engagement to, to marriage, what, what's the time frame? One year. One year. How many of you would disagree with that? Six months. Six months. That was ten months. Ten, you were ten months, yeah. And so what I realized was, how long did it take you guys to plan, okay, I'm going to ask the women, how long did it take you to plan your wedding? No, none of you, most of you are not married yet. You said a week, but how many of you have Pinterest boards with wedding stuff on it? How many of you, oh, thank you. She's like, way, how old were you when you started? You, you designed your wedding dress at how old? You were like 10, right? Okay, I was like about 12. I designed, my, my wedding dress has changed like, I don't know, you know, 10 times, you know? Um, but I plan, it's already planned. I just need the dude. I don't, man, we can do this fast, you know. But that's, that's planning a wedding. To plan for a marriage, that smacked me in the face. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have anything on my Pinterest. <laughs> I have no clue what to do with that, Lord. Show me. Show me. And in that conversation with the Lord, he started to reveal his design for marriage. And John and Lisa Bevere's book came out, Perfect Timing. I was like, you're so cool. You know, Perfect Timing, and it really has ministered to me. I'm still in it. I loved it about the whole curriculum, watching the DVDs, everything. It's been wonderful. Um, and uh, this is something that, that, that is in their book. Um, you know, I was thinking, because marriage preparation is a process of planning for one day. And marriage preparation is a process of planning for all of your days. Okay, and in the, this is what it says in their book. A couple may spend countless hours planning their wedding, but very little time mapping out the years that will follow the ceremony. The bride may spend many hours searching for the perfect dress while allotting only a few for premarital counseling. Consequently, the couple is largely unprepared when the fairy tale fades and they find themselves navigating a real relationship with very real problems. Wedding days are meant to be full of hope, beauty, and celebration. However, a relationship's long-term hope and beauty are best realized when couples invest the same fervor in planning their happy endings as they do in celebrating their starts. 
You know, I, I love that because that's planning, you know, um, the beginning from the end. Everybody knows how you want to end, right? You want to have your 50th wedding anniversary. You want to have grandkids, great-grandkids if you can. You know, all that stuff, right? You want to be in good health. Everybody knows what you want to do at the end. You just got to set your mind to it. Start planning your course, and the Lord will direct your steps. Uh, John Bevere says it, this in his book. He says, um, you know, who is everyone talking about at the horse races? The one who shot out at the gate or the one who finished? The one who finished, right? So... Everybody knows the, the movie Notebook? Anyone seen it? Anyone seen the Notebook? The guys are like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, we've, you've seen it. We know. You've done the late night Netflix. I know. All right. So what makes the Notebook such an epic love story, it's not because of how cute they were in the beginning. It's because of how they finished. They went through so much. They were both cute, both attractive. Oh, they were apart, came back together. Oh my gosh, all this stuff going on. And what mattered was how they finished. So when you plan your marriage, when you plan your course and you begin to honor your husband and your wife all the days of your life, plan a good, strong finish. And everything in between, you plan according to where you want to finish in your marriage. Like, it is never too early to plan for a successful marriage. It is never too early. And I thought about this. I'm like, what if someone asks me what age? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess singlehood would be a good time. You know, but really, um, Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When you train up a child... In the way he should go, he will not depart from it. We have to be trained as children. And many of us were like, oh, well, that's too late, obviously. Mm -hmm. But many of us, I was young in my faith, older in age, but young in my faith. I was a child in my faith. When I began my walk with the Lord, and the Lord trained me up in the way I should go. And that's why I'm standing here telling you it is never too early to start marriage preparation. When you have children, and many of you have children, those conversations started young when your three-year-old said, Mommy, I want to marry you. <laughs> like, can't, you can't marry me. I'm your mommy. Well, why not? You know? And so, like, those conversations, those are perfect moments to train them up. God told him there are only three groups of people and not four in the world. The, the world says there's children, there's adolescents, um, and then there, uh, sorry, Helen, there's babies, there's children, adolescents, and uh, adults. Well, the Lord said to him, that's wrong, that's the world. There are only babies, um, children, and then, I'm sorry, yeah, babies, children, and then adults. Like, oh my gosh, because here we are. I have worked with youth, uh, youth discipleship for years, and we're trying to train up the adolescents, but the Word of God says they're not even children anymore. We think, I, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm in a purity, so I get emails from moms and dads, and I'm like, you know, um, you know uh, Jill or Cindy, or, you know, is not really interested in boys right now. She, you know, she's 11, and I'm like, that's the best time to start. Because if you're going to wait until some little smooth little joker walks up on her, she is not going to be ready. She's just going to go, oh my gosh, okay, I've never gotten this attention before because it happened to me. And many of you can say amen to that, but you're not saying it right now. Okay. All right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You know, so I surveyed the landscape of marriages in my in, in, in my life. The, all these marriages that happened in front of me and I saw their relationships unfold, their dating relationships, their courtships, the proposals, all those things. And many, on many occasions I actually knew both the you know the, the, the wife and and the husband. So um, what I realized knowing them, many of their, you know, the things that they confided in me, a lot of their issue, their marital issues are rooted in issues they had when they were single. And I know this because I was sitting there praying, doing the, uh, the ugly cry with them, trying to make sure this issue is taken care of. Well, it did get taken care of because they brought that into the marriage and then they're done with it. 
That's what I realized. I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, I have so much I want to do. How many of you are perfect right now, ready to get married today? No, show of hands? What? How many of you could recognize, okay, you don't have to raise your hands for this one. How many of you can recognize in yourself one or two character flaws that you know you need to work on? Okay. You're brave. Thank you for raising your hands. And someone in the back was like this. <laughs> and prior to getting this revelation from the Lord, a lot of couples are probably not going to be interested in making character adjustments after engagement. They don't have time, and they've already, they're like, that's it. I'm already committed. There's no going back now. They're not going to, they're like, whatever. They're going to just take me for, and everyone's going to be like, oh, well, honey, I just love everything about you, except for that. No one's going to say that. Well, maybe some of us. Um, you know? The, you know those issues are there, and yet you haven't done anything about it, and you could do something about it now. So why not begin now to honor your spouse all the days of your life? Matthew 19, 11 through 12, in the message says this. And really, the whole story of marriage book is really centered on this scripture, which is really awesome in the message. It says, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. Mm -hmm. Some of you are thinking of people. <laughs> not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. Isn't that cool? And I was thinking, why is it gotta be large? Why can't I have my largeness now? Because marriage was created for multiplication. The Lord said in the very beginning, be fruitful and multiply. When my best friend got married, there was some serious multiplication going on. I could not get a coffee with this girl. I got to check with the na you know, with the with with the dad, you know, with the you know, my, the kids, the homework, the dinner, you know. Oh, I got to check with the breast pump. I got to check with. There was so much happening, and I was like, whoa. I'm never going to see you again. Love you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just, it's like that, but that's what happens. It's if you are, it says here, but if you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. It will take a lot of management, but you can do it with the presence of the Lord in your marriage. Amen. You can do it. Okay? Everybody grows old, but not everyone matures. Everybody grows old, but not everyone matures. And I love that. Maturity is what you will need to be married. How many children do you know that are married right now and they've got kids? <laughs> I'm like, you are like a giant kid right now. What are you doing? What are you doing married? And they keep grabbing more and you're like, stop, please. <laughs> you know? And so that's, that's what we're talking about. That's um, beginning with the end in mind. There is a resource, so get ready with your pen. I want to share this with you. Um, it's called The New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating. The New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating. It's not really new, by the way, but he is just saying it like it's new. <laughs> but what I love about this is by Andy Stanley. What I love about this is that he's saying it to the church in your face, just straight talking. That's new. I love the straight talk at church. It's awesome. I'm like, I'm grown. Just give it to me. You don't got to warm me up or butter me up. Just give it to me. Come on. This is what he says. The entire series. It's like a four-week series. Got to watch it. Watch it online. Okay? New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating. It's a sermon series by Andy Stanley. You can find it on uh, northpoint.org. It's his church. Um, but just Google him. You'll find it. It's an awesome series. It's a great resource. But the whole thing is centered around this. Are you who the person you're looking for is looking for? I'm going to say it over here. Are you who the person you're looking for is looking for? How many of you can say, oh, yeah, girl? Yeah, I am so the catch. Not many. <laughs> I can't even say that. I'm like, oh, gosh. 
yeah, I'm kind of looking for Superman. So yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, Rowena, you know? And so, because, you know, we have this tall order. How many of you have ever written a list of everything that you ever wanted in a person? How long? Yes. Oh, you are so brave to raise your hand. I love this group. This is great. All right. So I did it, and it was long and fat. <laughs> and then I looked down, and I did this years ago. It's, it was right when I had just accepted the Lord into my life. And I looked down, and I was like, whoa. I was even overwhelmed. I was like, whoa. I mean, it had character traits, you know, just you know, physical features and how everything, everything. And, um, and I looked at it and I was like, am I any of these things? And that, let's just say, I closed that notebook and I put it away for a very, very long time. To be honest, I can't even find it. Praise God, I can't. <laughs> because then I'd be so convicted. I'm like, am I any of those things, right? So we got work to do. Come on, we can do it, okay? All right, I'm gonna go there, you ready? Okay. There's this other book that I was reading, it's called Safe People. It's, called, it's by Dr. Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend, I'm getting some nods, awesome. Uh, John Townsend and Dr. Henry Cloud, they wrote this book together, it's called Safe People. I love that because in it, it tell, t talks about who unsafe people are and who safe people are. But what I got from it was Whoa, I, I do consider myself to be a safe person, otherwise I wouldn't be in ministry. Um, but I do know that I have been in unsafe seasons. You know, and I realized, I'm like, wow, I learned a lot from that book. And many of you came here thinking, you're, I'm going to give you like a 10-point thing on how to attract the best guy or girl. I'm not going to do that. You read that book, he'll tell you. Okay? He's got a lot of lists okay, of people who are unsafe and people who are safe. Many of you will read the list and go, oh my gosh, this is me. That means you've got a lot, lot to work on. I read it and was like, oh wow, highlight, okay, underline, I gotta work on some stuff, you know? And so safe people will attract safe people. Unsafe people are attracted to everybody because they're unsafe, right? They're attracted to you because you're safe, and they want to have a safe place to fall apart. Wow. That's good. That's good. You know, and um, and you know, and we get that. If you're a safe person, people just fall apart in front of you all the time. You're like, oh, are you okay? You know? <laughs> and so and you're constantly managing their fall apartness. And so so that's kind of that's that's a great resource for all of us. There's so much, so I, I just want to make sure you guys get all the information that I have because what you know the mysteries that the Lord is like revealed to me. I'm like, oh, I love this, this is great Lord. Um, it's been it's been blessing me in all of my relationships in the ministry and even in how I, I, I perceive marriage and and my singleness. Here's another thing that Andy Stanley says. I love this because his church, the vision for his church is um, is that they want it to be a church where unchurched people go. So they have a lot of unbelievers and kind of like they have, you know, there's a Jewish lady he talks about in one of his sermons that goes to, to, to church. He says she said she loves it except for the Jesus part, you know. And but, she, but he loves it, she still keeps coming. She like hosted an event and but you know, and he and she was like, Can you talk? But just don't talk about Jesus. And she's like, he's like, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, but like I love that. And so he had all these, you know, unbelievers or first timers coming in to their church because that's what they want. Yeah. That's what they want. They want unchurched people to come to the church. And that's so cool. I mean that's the idea for all the for all of our churches, but they really go after it to the point that when you become a Christian, a lot of them will, you know, might leave. You know, they're like, how do you keep them if they're once they come, they're church, then you're in a church of unchurched people. Anyways, watch the video, he'll tell you. And so he says this. Non-believers, he's talking to the non-believers this, and I was like, why is he talking to non-believers? <laughs> Which is funny, because usually we're talking to the believers when, we, when we're when we at Sunday sermons. He's talking to non-believers, he's like, oh, oh, by the way, if you're not a Christian, that's cool, you're here, I love it, we're gonna be talking about this whole dating and sex series, it's gonna be really cool, hang and hang tight, you know, some of it you might like, some of it you might, mm, you know, but just, just hang tight, keep coming, you know, and he says, non-believers should not date believers. Non-believers, he's telling them, like, by the way, if a believer brought you in your dating, you should not be dating this person. They're a Christian, you're not, and the reason is because the Christian wants you to accept Jesus. And they're like, oh, sorry, I, I just let the cat out of the bag. They want you 
to accept Jesus. They're Christians. They want you to accept Jesus. You know? And and he's straight talking. He says, and non-believers should not date believers because they will want you to live Christian moral standards. Are you ready for that? If you're ready, cool, that's awesome. But they will expect this of you and they will desire it and we are praying for you to, to live like this. And so he says, and also because they will desire to raise their children as Christians and because they're Christians in relationship with you, to stay with you in relationship, they will have to compromise their faith in God to accommodate a relationship with you. And if they're having sex with you, then they're a hypocrite and you don't even like hypocrites. I was like, dang, he said I high five the computer screen. Heavy <laughs> go get it. Because it's true. Here you are, bring in some guy that you met at the club, and you, you know, none of you. <laughs> that you met somewhere at work, and you're like, oh, he's coming, he's coming, but like you're attracted to him, and you're like, are hoping something's happening, and then he's gonna take you out to dinner or to church, and then like his hands are all over the place. You're like, oh, but I'm gonna flirt to convert, and I love that passage. And he's like, don't flirt to convert! Don't do it! Don't do it! <laughs> There's a whole event that we, we, we talked about. We talked about the topic of how to recognize relationship make-believers and counterfeits. I was in prayer one time, and I just kind of looked at the landscape of my friendships and my community at church and just even my life, and I was like, wow, there's non-believers. There's believers. I got some make-believers over here. <laughs> and I got some serious counterfeits over here. I was like, oh my gosh, the church is in danger. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, we need to tell everybody. So on our YouTube channel, you can find that. It's, um, it's called Relationship Make Believes and Counterfeits, you know, so, but I'll give you a couple of points that, that we, we talk about. How do we recognize the counterfeit if the intention is to deceive? How do you do it? If they're putting up all these smoking mirrors, how do you know? Now, do you know the difference between the fake and the real thing? Some of you got a Prada bag and a Prado bag. <laughs> you know, you know you did it. $40, yeah, I'll take it. You know? Do you know the difference between the fake and the real thing? Because when you have a relationship with the designer, you will know the real thing when you look inside it. Because all the outside could look perfect, but the second you open it, you're like, oh, no, no, no. Mm -mm -mm. That fruit is wax. No, no, no. <laughs> you know a tree by its fruit, but that is wax. No way. All right? And so Tim Keller says this in his book, Counterfeit Gods. When you, uh, you know when a good thing has become a counterfeit, when its demands on you exceed proper boundaries. Okay, I'll say it again, just for you. You know when a good thing has become a counterfeit, when its demands on you exceed proper boundaries. A counterfeit is made in, in the exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. That's a counterfeit. Some of you have been in a relationship with one of those, and praise the Lord, you are delivered from that, and if you're not in Jesus' name, I deputize you. <laughs> You're delivered from that right now. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says this, And no wonder, for Satan himself trans transforms himself into the angel of light. Notice in the beginning it says, No wonder. We should not be shocked when there's a counterfeit trying to roll up on you at church. And no wonder. For Satan wants to deceive you. He wants to steal your plans. Kill your dreams and destroy your life. That's his only agenda. You know, the make believer, I'll put I'll put this up there, you know, the make believer, make believe is the action of pretending or imagining typically that things are better than they really are. Some make believers, some of us maybe it's just a believer in a season of make believe where you think that everything's better than it really is. And it isn't. And that's why it's so important for us to be in relationship with one another because we can see what you can't. 
right? It's important for all of us to have those kind of friendships that will tell you, oh, yeah, that's, that's wax fruit, girl. Or that, you know, bro, you're my bro, I'm watching out for you, right? In James 1, in the ESV, it says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And that's what we do in seasons of make-believe. They, 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 they just hear it, but they don't do it. And so they deceive themselves. You know, we'll go through seasons like that. I, I, I recognize, I was like, oh my gosh, there were some seasons of make-believe I went through. Okay, all right, Lord, thank you. Thank you for that revelation. Okay, cool. You know, and then there are many of us who, uh, who have relationship idolatry. A lot of people in the ministry will come up and talk about, you know, the relationship that they have. But what they really have is relationship idolatry. They, they know all this. It ba- ba- baffles my mind. They know all these scriptures, but they fall in this area. It's, it's such a stronghold against them. And it says, uh, relationship idolatry is this. It causes believers to be susceptible to the deceptions of the counterfeits and make believers because they want so much to be in that relationship more than anything else. They will deceive themselves. They're like, oh, you're not Mr. Right? Oh, you're about to be Mr. Right. <laughs> you're about to be. You know, and you know, I did it. You're laughing because you did it too. Okay. And so Tim Keller says this in Counterfeit Gods. An idolatrous attachment can lead you to break any promise, rationalize any indiscretion, or betray any allegiance in order to hold on to it. It may drive you to violate all good and proper boundaries. To practice idolatry is to be a slave. So if you are sitting there, that's all you want to do, that is you're like marriage is going to fix everything, relationship idolatry. The idolatrous attachment can lead you to break any promise, rationalize any indiscretion, and betray any allegiance that you've made with you know, your mom, your pastor, anybody. You will rationalize it. And say, oh, why can't you just be happy for me? He's amazing. He'll get saved. God is able. <laughs> you know, I'm starting a fast next week. You should join me. Like they, they will rationalize anything. So, um, I think what you're saying. So they, a, a lot of a lot of my friends actually, technically legally, when they got their <coughs> marriage licenses, they were already married. Um, but they did not consummate their relationship because they're Christians and they wanted the the covenant before God. Then, you know, at the wedding day, and then they, that that was to them, that was like, no, now we're married. So they got the license and they were married by, you know, the government acknowledged them in, in their union and in all of their affairs and all of those things. But by God, that was not acknowledged. So they did not consummate it the day that they got the piece of paper. You know, they, they consummated it when they received the Holy Covenant of marriage with the Lord. And so, so, that, so does that mean if they haven't been married before the Lord, that they're still living in sin? If they were living together after the marriage? I believe that, you know, God knows our heart, you know, and if we come together in a union, you would, you know, it's a covenant. And um, and I, I personally, I've just given you my personal thing, um, is I don't think a clerk at the LA County Registrar is going to anoint my marriage as something that's going to be holy by God. You know, I've been to the LA County Registrar many, many times. It is not romantic. <laughs> it's not holy. It's not holy ground. It's there's no, there's no nothing going on there for me that I feel like God is going to bless my marriage. You know, in and so so yeah, if I I do have to honor on honor the laws and all that that, that stuff and get the license, but. I, because my heart is to, to be married to honor God, then I want God to bless this union and be, have it be recognized and acknowledged in his kingdom and not in this one. So this, uh, this little quote is from uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was um, uh, a pastor who was imprisoned during uh, the, you know, the Nazi regime uh, because he was against it. And so he wrote this, uh, this uh, a very long wedding sermon, actually, for I think it was his niece. But there's a part of it that really resonated with me. And I learned about this uh, when I was listening to um, John and Lisa Bevere's podcast. So it says this, God is guiding your marriage. Marriage is more than your love for each other. It is a higher dignity and power, for it is God's holy ordinance through which he wills 
to perpetuate the human race till the end of time. In your love, in your love, you see only your two selves in the world, but in marriage, you are a link in the chain of the generations, which God causes to come and to pass away to his glory and calls into his kingdom. In your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness, but in marriage, you are the place at a, you are placed at a post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. It is not your love that sustain the, sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. That last statement, rock my world, that's going to be on my wall pretty soon because it says, it is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. Because we think, oh, we're so in love. And then you're like, but we're out of love, so we're going to have irreconcilable differences and we're going to divorce. No, from now on, the, it is the marriage that sustains the love. It, it holds it in, contains the love. You know, I had seven pages of notes that I wanted to share with you guys. I only got to share three, but you know what? That just tells me that we got to do this again. Um, and hopefully if you've given us a little bit of feedback, um, uh, we'll be able to uh, improve this experience and uh, even topics, um, areas that you'd like to go more into. But what we, what we really wanted to focus on today was to implore you, encourage you, push you, drag you, kicking if we have to, to go and start the process of premarital counseling now. You know, it's, it's, it's something that, um, you know, pray about it, you know, but uh, if your desire is to be married, then this is something to prayerfully consider doing. You know, pastor said he might not be the counselor. I, I, I'd highly recommend him. He's great. Um, but this is something that you want to explore now so that you can then prepare yourself to finish well. Okay? So these are conversations you need to have to equip yourself to know what questions to ask when you are in a relationship. Because once you're in a relationship, you're like, goo goo gaga, everything is okay. It's okay. He's a total jerk last night, but it's fine because you'd rather not be alone. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, for the first time you had a dinner date. No, and I love this. Pastor says this all the time. Um, Pastor Jensen says it all the time. He's like, I um, hope I don't mess it up, but I'm going to paraphrase. Don't use a permanent solution for a temporary problem. Singleness is not a problem. It's a blessing. It's the, it's the beautiful staging ground for an incredible marriage is what it is. And if you are not staging for the marriage that you're going to walk into because it's your heart's desire, I know it because God put it there, then you're going to come in completely ill-equipped and prone to fail. There's a quote that I wanted to share um, by Tim Keller, and he wrote uh, this great article for Redeemer Church. And you know, he's a church in in Manhattan, New York, and his church is a mega church, and it's predominantly of singles. And he's like, "What is wrong with this? Is like a very peculiar demographic in Manhattan? It's because there's a lot of single people." in that city. Well, he wrote this whole thing about, um, it's called uh, The Gospel and Sex, and uh, you can find it at RedeemerChurch, um, I guess, .org or .com, um, but he says this, it says, uh, we abstain from extramarital sex in order to witness how God works in the gospel. That's important. We abstain from extramarital sex in order to witness how God works in the gospel. God calls his people into an exclusive relationship with him, a marriage covenant, and to give him anything less in return is unfaithfulness. By our faithfulness to one another within a community that requires, finally, loyalty to God, we experience and witness to the first fruits of the new creation. Our commitment to exclusive relations witnesses to God's pledge to his people. So, although it is common to hear people say, sex is a private affair and no one's business but my own, it is not true. How we use sex has significant community and political ramifications. That's true. And um, 
I, I, I spoke to a girlfriend of mine, she actually is a sexual integrity speaker, and we were talking about, um, she wanted to talk about, she's like, I want to talk about sex, and I want to talk about worship. And I was like, you know what I always say to just friends of mine who've gotten married, uh, or about to get married, is, I'm like, remember, sex is worship. Remember, it's worship. So I pray that you worship a lot in your house. <laughs> You know, like worship all the time. It's worship. You know, and and often when a female doesn't want to worship, it's because she feels um, uh, not beautiful or inadequate or unloved or undesired. You know, and so words do, like Pastor said, are important to to us women. And so, but what I learned today was the praise. The praise that does that goes miles you know, when you praise men. It's really cool. I have a brother and a dad, and that just goes for uh, for days. You know, when my dad was still here, we would I would just praise him, and he was like, "Whatever, whatever you want to do, what do, you want to do? <laughs> anything you want, anything." You know, someone either Twitter or Facebook me, and he, and they and he said, you know, um, he said that you know men. He was talking about his concern. He's like, you know, um, he was saying, you know. The man was sharing that he wasn't just sacrificing his heart and his freedom, but the dignity of his, uh, the destiny of his life and the women and the children and his children to the woman that he would choose as a wife. So he's basically kind of, I guess, you know, ranting a little bit like, I have to choose a wife, you know, and I sacrifice my heart and my freedom and my destiny and my children to just this one woman. So it's like a serious choice. I would agree with that. That is absolutely right. Yeah. He who finds a, fi finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So yeah, you've got some serious work to do in choosing the wife. Because it's a it's a lifelong commitment, right? And so so I thought about this and I was like, well, we have to do the same thing. We sacrifice the same. We sacrifice our heart, our freedom, our destiny, our lives, and our children. Um, but this is something that smacked me in the face was we also sacrifice our name. We relinquish our name to receive your name. And then we would give you our bodies to bear your children. So, yeah, you can rant to me and tell me what you're giving up, but we are not... Woman was born out of the womb of man, but then you absorb us back into, into you by us relinquishing our identity as, as an individual so that we can take your name, so that your line could continue. That's important to God. Because the design for marriage isn't just so that you could have sex and have it a lot. The design for marriage is to make children, and not just children, but children of God. Amen. To perpetuate the, the, the glory of his name until the end of time. That's the design for your marriage. And so, now this is, what, uh, this is uh, what Tim Keller talks about in the Gospel and Sex. We must remember that the sacrifice made by the single is not that of giving up sex, but the, but the much more significant sacrifice of giving up heirs. So some of you are experiencing that biological clock ticking and you want to have children, tell the clock to shut up because there's no biological clock in the Bible. Trust me, I went through it. There's childbearing years and then there's non-childbearing years. But you talk about a woman that shouldn't have been because she was beyond her childbearing years and she got pregnant and then a virgin and I got pregnant. You tell me. All right, is there a biological clock? Okay, thanks. So <laughs> let me continue. So we must remember, remember that the sacrifice made by the single is not that of giving up sex, but the much more significant sacrifice of giving up heirs. There can be no more radical act in, than in this as it is the clearest institution, institutional expression that one's future is not guaranteed by the family, but by the church. Therefore, we are to choose between marriage or singleness, not on the basis of whether we want the personal happiness and the status of family, but on the basis of which states, by the basis of which state makes us most useful in the kingdom of God. So you might desire to be married, and you might not get married. You might not want to be married at all, and then you get married. Some of you were like, that's it, I'm not coming to your event, I don't want to be married. Right, but the desire for marriage is in you, to perpetuate the name, to bring glory to his name. And so, 
And so for us, for, for you know, I can, I'll just speak for the women. To be absorbed back into you, that's just a reflection of you submitting your life, laying your men for laying your life down. Like Christ laid down his life for the church. So you relinquish your name to bear his and to bear children for him. Because the spirit of adoption is through Christ. So that's how God perpetuates his kingdom. So it's not like, oh, you know, it's not like, oh, I have to do this and you don't get to do that. Actually, you do relinquish your name. Because your children are not your kids. They're God's children. They are children of God. All right? So that is why marriage preparation is important and to start as soon as possible. 